The following video contains spoilers. We suggest watching the episodes alone in the dark. Hello, Wolfpack! We're back! And while Halloween might be over once again, it's all good because it's Twilight Zone Month! For those of you who don't follow us on our social media pages, we're starting a whole new tradition around here. Every November here at Wolf Entertainment will be dedicated to nothing except reviews on the classic horror anthology series, The Twilight Zone. At least until we run out of the show's episodes, but that's okay because we only have over 400 of them across multiple reboots of the franchise, so we might as well take a few out while we can. What episodes will be on these specials, you may ask? Well, they could be almost anything. Some might be good, some bad, some meh, and some underrated. But since there are so many dark adventures that even we haven't seen yet, we'll just have to wait and check them all out. What I do know is that we're going to be doing videos like this for a lot of episodes that get heavily requested for us, and we'll be doing these specials for years to come. <laughs> come. So, what's our very first Twilight Zone tale of this new tradition? Well, we're taking on a long-lost gem from the infamous 2000s Twilight Zone reboot, dubbed The Collection. This tale is, you guessed it, a horror story featuring some killer dolls. Yay! Always a goodie here on this channel. The 2000s Twilight Zone reboot earned so much scorn from viewers, both old and new, for Serling's masterwork, due to being perceived as a much weaker era for the franchise's history. But if you can believe it or not, some fans actually defend this story as one of the rare good episodes. Is that true? Is there hope for this show after all? Is this episode really a positive and grim horror story from this series? Let's find out. Beware your lovable stuffed animals and toy collections, kids. Because your little buddies may have it out for you. This is my review on the so-called good G3 Twilight Zone adventure, The Collection. So, our episode opens up with an amazingly eerie establishing shot of a homely suburban house where we cut to a little girl playing with a dollhouse that looks exactly like her real home. I'll admit that right off the bat, I love this opening scene since it really reminds me of Hereditary and does a decent job at foreshadowing how some stuff will be playing out. We then meet our two main characters. A shy, antisocial little girl who gets neglected by her parents named Danielle Randall, and her babysitter, a college-aged woman who is studying child psychology named Miranda Evans, played by Jessica Simpson. <laughs> yeah, right, Jessica Simpson playing a college kid becoming a child doctor. <laughs> Most unrealistic part of this whole Twilight Zone adventure. Yeah, the Twilight Zone really got professional singer Jessica Simpson for a horror story. But not only that, her character is supposed to be a smart child psychologist student in the making who's vital to the story arc. It's an interesting setup for sure, but I don't think Jessica Simpson should have been the first choice for this kind of role. 
I mean, come on, G3 Twilight Zone. You had Katherine Heigl, Shannon Elizabeth, Linda Cardellini, and even Elizabeth Berkeley on this show. But out of all your big celebrity guest stars, you chose Jessica Simpson for this role. You know, you could have easily gotten somebody else believable as a child psychologist, right? I just felt like the show should have relied on somebody more serious for this plot. Regardless, Simpson does okay for now, but we'll get to her weaknesses soon enough later. What's important is that the babysitter is meant to be a clever character studying this little girl as she babysits her for the irresponsible parents, who, as you'll soon see in all their scenes, treat Danielle like she was nothing but window dressing rather than a true family member. The Randall parents are going out for a while, but leave their daughter in the care of a professional babysitter who offers the girl a friendly hand of trust out of the goodness of her heart. Studying children is just a bonus in her job, but Miranda does prove to be a compassionate and caring person overall. As she gets settled into her new job, Danielle's mother soon hands her a large profile on her own daughter. Yeah, you heard that right. This woman keeps a profile of her own daughter, showing us that she micromanages everything in sweet little Danny's life and controls her like a test subject rather than a child. This binder lists what she eats, what she hates, what she watches on TV, and even what she fears. Jeez, this woman is almost as bad as Norma Bates. The episode pretty much makes it loud and clear that Danielle has very, very horrible parents. The father appears to neglect Danielle emotionally and distances himself from her because she's a girl and men suck at relating to girl things. While her mother is an uptight control freak who dominates Danielle's life and doesn't seem to view her daughter as something normal, but rather looks down upon her as a pet. Oh, and if you don't believe me on that, this episode literally spells that out for us when the mom nicknames her own daughter, Pet. Now we're late. Good night, Pet. Bottle! Bottle! Yeah, we'll be going into the parents more sometime down the line, but the episode really hammers it in that they're more neglectful to their own child than the parents from Worry Dolls. They suck, but that's going to be the point later. The big things here on these scenes are some foreshadowing, demonstrating to us why Danielle is so antisocial to begin with, Miranda gaining an understanding of Danny's life so she can bond with the poor girl, and the idiot parents leaving the duo all alone in this big scary house, where I'm so sure that nothing can possibly go wrong. It seems like a simple opening upon first glance, but it does do a decent job dropping the clues for our twisted end results. So while Danielle and Miranda are all alone, the two of them click instantly and go to hang out in the little girl's bedroom before Forrest Whitaker pops in to give us his ghostly warnings. Miranda Evans has a bond with children. She understands their problems. But tonight, she will meet a special little girl with a very unique problem that will stretch Miranda's bond with reality itself. Gee, thanks, Forrest. You're about as subtle as the terrible parents. So Danielle shows Miranda her awesome bedroom where the babysitter takes an interest in the kids' bizarre Barbie doll toys, which stare ominously all around the room. But Danielle tells her that those toys are not for playing with because they're just antiques for her collection. However, before Miranda can ask more about this collection of hers, one of the dolls flips over. She offers to place it back for the girl, but Danielle tells her not to, and insists that she does it herself, grabbing a secret key for her secret shelf. But when she touches it, the doll bites her hand, drawing blood in the process. 
Danielle blames the doll for attacking her, but Miranda thinks that it was just an accident, and takes Danielle away for some first aid, telling her that dolls aren't really alive. But as they go, the doll gives us, what else? A scary face. <coughs> Frabjous day, the scary face gag is back in action. Ugh, shut up, house. Exactly like on Lily D and the Worry Dolls, we're going to be getting more scary face close-ups on the killer dolls, people. While I do think the dolls do look creepy thanks to those vacant stares and the suspense of them never being seen motioning on screen, the scary face shots once again feel a tad unrequired, since the horror is fine enough on its own with the subtle scares. But hey, it's nearly impossible to go a single killer doll story without at least a few nightmare faces tossed into them, so stick to the formula. Nevertheless, I actually kind of like these killer dolls in the end, since they almost give off the fear that your Barbie dolls could be alive and appear disturbing when put in the right angles. So good work, Twilight Zone. You made some decent killer dolls here. They're no Lily D, but they come pretty close. We then cut to Miranda treating the kid's wounds, while Danielle tells her that the doll who bit her is named Shelly, and she assaulted her because she was jealous of how Miranda was becoming her new best friend, implying that Shelly is a yandere. But of course, Miranda doesn't believe that at all, while the doll does another scary face. <coughs> I think you all know where this is going. The killer dolls are obviously alive, the adult isn't going to believe the kid hero, and this will lead to a nightmarish confrontation later, where the main hero endures all the horrors of the killer dolls thanks to not heeding the obvious warnings. Yawn, snore, we've seen it before. Is there anything that can redeem this super typical horror formula? Actually, yes, there is. Danielle continues telling her babysitter that her dolls are alive, which naturally fall on deaf ears. But the little girl also does go into very unsettling detail about the connection she has with some of her dolls, which implies some mental problems on both sides. Despite some hiccups in their relationship, she admits that they're all her only friends because she has never had any real human friends before in her life, relying on the dolls for companionship. However, there have been some fights and arguments increasing between them as of lately. It honestly almost feels like an abusive relationship on par with Alice and the House from My Old House. Danielle is horribly neglected by her idiot parents, so it comes across as an abusive relationship being all she can understand. You notice how that despite the fact that Shelly bites her owner, Danielle flat out refuses to get rid of the killer doll afterwards. Danielle sees it as a minor mishap, and at no point ever considers removing the doll from her life. Almost like there's something darker between the two of them. That's kind of screwed up. It also really throws the viewer off track when we start inching towards the grander plot reveals. Not to mention it grants Danielle some sympathy due to her friendless background and her very close link to the creepy toys that she holds onto for unknown reasons. Danielle confesses that the dolls were her only friends for most of her life, and she even gave them all very detailed backstories that seem a tad too deep for an average little girl to come up with. Miranda views this sob story as an attempt to bond with the little girl, so she offers to be her new real best friend, and informs her that she shouldn't worry too much about those dumb dolls, but when they leave, we get even more scary faces. Ah. Uh. Come on, Twilight Zone. At least the haunting hour spaced out the creepy faces between the scenes. The two go downstairs to snack, but Danielle continues sharing her doll's intricate backstories with Miranda. 
how they all have their favorite foods, TV shows, fears, and personalities, differentiating each of them like they were separate people, as she also goes on and on about how much fun they all have. This scene almost reminds me of that opening with the parents and how Danny's control freak mother kept a binder portfolio on her own little girl like she herself was nothing more than a doll with a stats card. Hmm, could this be some clever metaphor? However, unlike the jerk mother, Danielle reveals that she's deeply lonely and these dolls are all that she has to spend her time on. Yeah, life sure was boring without the internet and video games, wasn't it? Get a Twitter page, girlfriend! She needs friends and some social skills, but nobody has ever reached out to help her. Miranda tries to be that assist trophy, and for the most part, you do almost feel sorry for this poor girl. Especially when she drops hints that her relationship with the killer dolls isn't all fun and games. <laughs> Alright, Twilight Zone, I'll admit that I like how you're gearing up towards something grim on the horizon, but we need some rising tension other than scary faces. Is this going to be as big as you're making it out to be? Surprisingly, yes, because after all this setup, we finally get some much-needed tension again. Danielle offers to get some board games to play, and after Miranda agrees to play them, the kid goes off all alone upstairs to grab the haunted house game for them. While Miranda scribbles some notes on Danielle's troubling unchildlike behavior, stating how poor Danny is stuck in a fantasy world to escape from her depressing reality, also noting that it's because she is a misunderstood child who's antisocial and is so sheltered that she might have some issues assimilating to the real world. You know, while I do agree that this is a clever character analysis and all, I still find it hard to buy that it's Jessica Simpson who's theorizing all this. Seriously, the lady who said yes to these piece of crap movies is really supposed to be our brilliant child psychologist in the making. I'm sorry, but that just bugs me how absurd this is. Jessica Simpson as a smart intellectual doctor. Yeah, right. And Seth MacFarlane cartoons are totally appropriate for children. You know, I think the lesson here is it really doesn't matter where you're from. As long as we're all the same religion. However, as she takes notes, Danielle gives off a fake scream, putting a pause on the foreshadowing. When Miranda checks up on the kid, it's revealed that the doll Shelly is gone. Danielle warns her that they need to find Shelly immediately before it's too late. But when Miranda tries to help by locking up the doll case, they see that the key is gone. Miranda assumes that Danielle is doing all of this as a means of playing a game with her and simply acts along by pretending that she believes her dolls are real and combs the area with her. But as they leave, the other dolls give us another scary face. <coughs> the duo search the area, but they then hear some noises from downstairs. They look around, finding some broken objects, but Miranda again assumes that this is all just Danielle acting up to gain attention. She believes that Danielle is living through the dolls' misbehavior as a means to make people notice her, where we get an actually decent emotional moment of the young girl feeling heartbroken because her new best friend naturally doesn't believe her. It honestly does feel kind of sad, since Danielle feels upset that the only adult paying attention to her well-being for the first time doesn't trust her over the killer dolls getting violent and ramps up some of the tension by having Miranda totally blind to the dolls, thanks to the antagonists being clever by not revealing their existence until they gain the upper hand. It feels real gloomy, but as good as this emotional distrust scene is, it soon gets ruined by this awful fake tripping scene and the little girl's bad injury acting. 
instead of locking them up. I can't take them out of the case. I told you. Why don't you believe me? I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't laugh, but that's just unintentionally hilarious. <laughs> Not helping is the girl's bad line read and truly weak dialogue here. I'm acting so bad! Funnily enough, the little girl is actually good in most of her scenes. Better than Jessica Simpson, in fact. But this was easily her weakest moment in the story. Somebody really should have done a second take, because that acting was pitiful. It does get serial again when we see that she tripped over Shelly, hinting that this was the doll's attempt to kill Danielle. The girl warns Miranda to lock up Shelly right now to prevent any further danger, but like a total moron, she instead calls the parents for where the first aid kit is and holds off on locking the killer doll up again a little longer. Miranda finally takes the kid and Shelly off to bed, treats Danielle's injuries, and then remembers to lock up Shelly in her cabinet again. But when they return to the bedroom with Shelly, they see that all the dolls have escaped now, and are somewhere inside the house. Dun, dun, dun. Oh my gosh! It finally happened! We at long last got a scary scene from the 2000s Twilight Zone! I know you can kind of see it coming, since they did loudly say that they couldn't find the cabinet key, but this scene of the now-abandoned doll case where all the Barbies got out to go on a killing spree is just bone-chilling. It's so creepy that it blows my mind that the 2000s Twilight Zone was capable of delivering such a slightly scary moment for once. So congrats, Reboot. You had a decent scare in the end. Well done. However, for some reason, Miranda still thinks that this is all just Danielle acting up for some attention and accuses her of doing this. Despite the fact that Danielle has been by her side all night at this point. Danielle once again tells the babysitter that her Barbie dolls are all alive and totally evil. She really locked them up in that cabinet to prevent them from causing horrific dangers and urges Miranda to help her recapture them. But of course, Miranda doesn't believe her. Good lord, how dense is this chick? Then again, she did say yes to all these flicks. <laughs> However, when Miranda takes the kid downstairs for a talking to, we see the army of killer dolls awaiting them, with some scary faces. <laughs> Wow, the dolls actually look pretty dang ominous here. Good work, set designers, I love it. It's at long last made crystal and sparkling clear to Miranda that all of the killer dolls are indeed alive and evil when they try killing them. Yeah, Shelly, how dare you try to kill my best friend? You are so grounded. Miranda also finds a strange bracelet in the shattered vase remains, which Danielle claims belongs to her. 
However, Miranda puts that off for now to call some help, but it's too late because the dolls just cut the line. We get some incredibly tense horror as the duo tries to maneuver around the deadly dolls, but the toys thought of everything. They stole Miranda's cell phone battery, cut the power, and surrounded them. Sadly, all this intense scary stuff is soiled by Jessica Simpson's bad, bad acting. Ugh, acting. This gets us into the biggest part which I had a problem with. Jessica Simpson's horrendous acting. Now, I've held off on this because, to be fair, Jessica Simpson is seriously not that bad at the beginning. While she's not epic, she is passable. I think one could still enjoy the story, despite Simpson not being perfect at her acting skills. And I did truly feel that she could be a caring babysitter like she's supposed to be. However, her acting becomes straight up awful when the horror takes over. Jessica Simpson is absolutely wretched at pretending to be scared. Once she confronts the killer dolls, her acting gets so wooden, unrealistic, and unintentionally hilarious that it's so difficult to take in seriously. Her voice and reactions just sound so bad and totally fail to click with the grim horror scenarios she's surviving in. This sucked me out of the conflict so many times because the leading lady fails to deliver. She just sounds so dull. Jessica Simpson's attempts to sound afraid of all the horror stuff just sounds super fake, and she comes across like she's more so annoyed that the dolls are bothering her over being terrified for dear life. My battery. Danielle? Some children who play alone may be at increased risk for later problems. Shelly, I don't know what you and your freaky little friends are up to, but I'm taking Danielle and getting out of this horror movie. Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! Yeah, no Emmy again this year, huh, Simpson? Damn it! While Miranda, ahem, panics about all this, Danielle disappears without a trace, while the babysitter finds a warning note from the evil dolls, telling her to leave now, with a significant highlighted section on her notes regarding children loneliness and their dangers. Miranda desperately searches around the house for her child, but she actually trips over a stuffed animal the dolls laid out and knocks herself out. Our hero, ladies and gentlemen. She apparently can't see danger when it's right in front of her and trips over her own stupidity. She is so screwed. Miranda wakes up a few minutes later to the screams of Danielle coming from upstairs, and she sees that the dolls took over the entire house. <coughs> Finally having enough of all this madness, we get an intense scene of Miranda fighting off the killer doll army to save the child. Which could have been so cool if it wasn't ruined again by Jessica Simpson's awful acting. Simpson, you're trying to rescue a child from certain death. Can you at least pretend you're risking something to save her? Damn it. She makes it up into Danielle's cage and encourages the child that they can beat those evil dolls by sticking together. 
But then Danielle panics and fights with her sitter over the stuffed animal she used as a weapon, where all of a sudden, some wallets fall out of it. Miranda looks at all of them, where she sees some pictures of Danielle's dolls, but as humans. Where it's revealed that all of the killer dolls in her collection were really Danielle's former babysitters from the past. Danielle is really a witch, and she's had dark magic this entire time. She's used her limited skills in the dark arts to turn her babysitters into dolls, so she can play with them and keep them as her best friends forever and ever and ever. Yep, this was our big plot twist. Danielle, the shy, antisocial child with no friends, was really our true villain all along, and the killer dolls were actually the good guys. This whole time, the dolls were trying to warn Miranda that Danielle was the evil one. They weren't trying to kill her, they were trying to kill the witch. They were sending Miranda warnings this whole time to escape while she still had the chance and wanted to kill Danielle so the newest babysitter wouldn't suffer the same fate they did. All the killer dolls have been held captive in the collection cabinet, against their will, because Danielle could never let them go. When Miranda confronts the kid over this, little Danny at last breaks down crying and confesses that all she ever wanted was friends. She thought her babysitters were truly her real best friends who would stay with her forever and bond with her while her idiot parents neglected her all her life. She couldn't handle being rejected and friendless anymore, ignored by other people, so she used her dark magic to keep them by her side at all times, in a form that she could take care of them in FOREVER. Jesus. Wow, that's actually an incredibly shocking twist. Seriously. Now, I have read a lot of comments and criticisms arguing how predictable it all was, but honestly, I'm more impressed that they made a decent twist villain with a complex motivation. Yeah, it is kind of unsurprising, thanks to Danielle acting just as much suspicious as the dolls do, but the episode actually grants her a higher motivation that we've been building up to in all this time. Danielle's antisocial behavior and neglect led her down this sick, villainous path. All she ever wanted were friends, but after getting ignored for so long, she decided to make people pay attention to her. She didn't want to be left with her uncaring, neglectful, abusive jerk parents forever, and the only people who ever shared concerns for her were simply babysitters who were only in her life temporarily. When they had to leave to work with other children, she couldn't handle it, because as a child with no one there for her, she clinged to the demented idea that they can be with her forever in her fantasy world. Just as Miranda predicted with her notepad. What I'm trying to say is that this Twilight Zone tale actually managed to have a good twist villain, and did offer up a deep reason behind her evils. Our big Twilight Zone monster in all of this is not a killer doll, but simply a little girl with great power, but no true friends. Living in a harmful environment that led to her downfall into darkness. The killer dolls are also revealed to be the greater victims in all of this, because they have been trapped under this unstable child's cage for so long that they've jumped on board with murdering the girl as soon as possible, but do have some morality and common sense to save other hapless victims and prevent this tragedy from growing any further. The dolls had characters too, beyond being simple evil psycho killers. Both our antagonists have some disturbing tragedy underneath, and are merely victims of somebody else's grim mechanizations. 
However, the dark actions naturally led to a violent conflict escalating to worse scenarios that hurt both sides even more. I actually love this plot turn. Yeah, I'm certain some people saw it coming, but it has something more than a shocking twist. Long-term consequences. Not only is it scary to think about, but it's ingeniously excellent character writing. Danielle being neglected and controlled by her horrific parents caused her to form into a villain who is clinging to what she perceives as a real strong friendship based upon her horrible twisted worldviews. While the dolls are not evil either, but actually the victims trying to get out because they were once people who lost their humanity, yet also want to prevent even worse happenings down the road by trying to at least warn Miranda what What's really going on here? It shows us how the abuse both Danielle and her prisoners endured made them into darker and disturbed people because they couldn't get help or nobody just plain paid attention to their suffering. If somebody had just reached out to them, all this pain could have been avoided altogether. Wow, this is shockingly fantastic horror storytelling here. And it's by the 2000s Twilight Zone, no less. The 2000s Twilight Zone, the one that everyone hates and completely blows off, managed to pull out a great, complicated, emotional horror story just as powerful as the Haunting Hours Lily D story arc. That's amazing! Why does no one like this show? But let's get back on track. Upon realizing that Danielle has relationship issues, she attempts to leave this craziness, but Danielle forces her to stay with a hug. Get away from you! Don't be mad! Go, go! Let me go, Danielle! Let me go! Woman, she's just a little girl! How can you not escape that grasp? I can only assume that Danielle might be using some type of magic here too as a way to enhance her strength, because there's no way a college-aged girl can be held back by a 10-year-old's hug. As you can guess, Danielle doesn't like that her new best friend tried to leave her like all the others. And now that she's lost everything, let me assure you, she is pissed. The dolls desperately scratch at the door to save her, but in a very creepy scene, Danielle transforms Miranda into a doll too, in the most nerve-wracking way possible. Well, critics always did say Jessica Simpson looked a little plastic. Now we finally get to our twist ending. We actually get a time skip to a few hours later where the parents came back and are upset with how their home was left upon seeing Miranda's disappearance. Oh come on, the parents just came back and somehow didn't raise any questions on the dolls laid all over the place? You morons! The idiot father complains to the babysitter agency on how another one of their sitters ditched his crying daughter in the middle of the night, while the freak mother actually shames her own depressed daughter for scaring away another babysitter and grounds her. Let me assure you, she is pissed. Yep, it's official. The Randall parents are now worse than Jeffrey's parents from The Walls, Jason's dad from Bad Egg, and Jack Dixel Sr. from Spores combined. Danielle's parents are straight-up abusive monsters who take no responsibility for raising their child properly or emotionally support her in her distress at all. But if you can believe it or not, that's actually the whole point. Why? 
Well, because we see in the twisted conclusion, Danielle actually emulates her control freak of a mother's personality while she lectures and grounds the dolls for not loving her, getting her into trouble once more, and locks them up again for disobeying her rules. This time, adding the doll of Miranda. Now, a lot of people actually hated this scene for essentially having all of the Randalls get away completely scot-free with their horrible actions and the glaring plot holes in it. But personally, I think it's pretty good and does a decent job at answering some of the questions some people had in the comments and criticisms. Number one, it's important to note that the parents are awful people and are 100% at fault for Danielle's villainy. But we see that to this little girl, her behavior is not seen as wrong in her eyes because she's just doing what her own mother does. She got grounded and lectured to, so she in turn copies her mother's screwed up actions and raises her innocent dolls precisely like how her bad parent raised her. So it metaphorically represents how a bad role model only creates more bad people exactly like them. And number two, a ton of people yelled, How the heck has nobody noticed the growing doll collection? Why has nobody called the cops or noticed it was Danielle being evil? Do the parents or even the babysitting agency not pick up on all these weird happenings? Actually, that's also kind of the point of the central message. Danielle has gotten away with this for quite some time, precisely because no one has ever noticed her. She's invisible. No one has ever been there for her or reached out to help this poor girl conquer her mental pain. No one has had her taken away from these abusive monsters or looked into her home life. Heck, no one has even realized her powers. This little girl has superpowers, and yet no one has ever noticed her. Danielle's parents don't care, because they don't see Danielle as a person in need, and she herself is not exactly in a strong mental state to seek help, so she can't leave. She just sticks with these pricks, because she's a kid who doesn't know any better. She can't even accept that her way is wrong when called out on it, because she's merely a broken child. The fact that nobody, not even the police, has ever caught on to this grim horror makes it all the more darker. It makes you think, how long is it going to take until Danielle does get caught? How many more people is she going to need to turn into dolls until the world wakes up on how this child needs serious help? How long is Danielle going to endure the abuse in this house before she finally snaps and goes carry? The truth is that we, as a society, sometimes don't notice or take into account the depressing real-world problems some people face in their life or all around us. We don't notice serious issues until it's too late. A child could be getting abused, but the fact that nobody has noticed or done anything to stop it only increases the tragedy and path to darkness taken by somebody who has not gained any help or outright refused to seek help. I honestly think that the plot hole about how the cops, the idiot parents, or the babysitting agency hasn't caught on to these disappearances of multiple babysitters at this one house, thanks to Danielle's mental trauma, is intentional. It's a social commentary on neglected children and the innocent victims who need our help, but are unable to get it because nobody gets involved in their life. It's a plot element on how the world hasn't discovered any of this yet. No one knows that all the babysitters vanished at this one house. The parents are stuck in their own myopia to be bothered to raise any questions. And the police and social services are completely oblivious to this little girl's need for help because that's sometimes a sad reality we live in. We don't notice until it's too late. A lot of the time, we don't realize a tragic event is upon us because we failed to notice something slightly off or raised any questions at troubling signs. We're all flawed. We make mistakes. 
However, we do need to prevent dark events while we can, and need to be more aware in life. Danielle Randall is a tragic villain with an incredible gift, but she stuck using it for evil because she was raised in an environment where she thinks that caring for people means controlling others. Her parents failed to see her or her powerful magic because they simply don't care about her in a real loving way. As far as we know, she got away with all of this for now, but it is possible that people will start to raise questions and catch on the more this escalates to something worse than the adventure we just endured. It's a tragic case about how we should pay attention to people who need our help and we have to get involved if it can prevent worse events to come. Danielle is the villain because the world ignored her or failed to help her, which will only lead to her adding more and more victims among her collection, treating people as toys to play with like her own mother does to her. So what I'm trying to say is that I think this episode is good and the plot holes aren't really that big enough to ruin the whole story. The episode wants you to think about it by purposefully leaving it open and ambiguous. And so our tale of ghoulish nightmares and grim tragedy concludes with Saw Gerrera's closing narration. Miranda Evans thought she could help a little girl overcome her fears. Now, Miranda will be able to ponder the true meaning of fear from inside a glass prison known as the Twilight Zone. And that was the end to the fan-favorite 2000's Twilight Zone tale of suspense, The Collection. How does it hold up? Well, much to my surprise, I thought it was really awesome. I'm serious, this Twilight Zone horror flick is supremely well done and is incredible, even to this very day. I'm blown away how well this tale is at standing up on its own, despite all the harsh criticisms towards the infamous Gen 3 Twilight Zone. I can safely say that I think this one is indeed one of the rare successes on its chart. I was kind of impressed with how deep this one turned out to be, because I honestly went in expecting it to just be the usual unoriginal killer doll tale, but in the end, it was revealed to be so much more. The biggest highlight of this adventure is the story. The story is very well written and did pack a bit of a gut punch by the time the conflict starts worsening. This wasn't just a tale about psychotic evil dolls killing people, but rather a tale about a shy little girl growing corrupted thanks to her piss-poor parents and the lack of necessary attention she so desperately needed. The killer dolls were intimidating supernatural characters, but the grand twist is revealing that they were victims too in all of this. And they sought revenge for this girl ruining their lives, while also maintaining some morality when they try to warn Miranda to get out while she can so she won't end up in their shoes like so many others have. Now, some people would most likely see the twist coming, especially horror fans, that the dolls were all once humans too, and tied to all the missing babysitters that come up in chats from time to time. But I think it still works, because the big twist came from the reveal that everyone in this was a victim in some way. That Danielle is not the Damien spawn this episode could have made her out as. The true moral of all this was to not treat children as projects that need to be worked on and looked at through a logical science lens, but rather that people need emotional connections as well when they're in need, not just a psychologist labeling them under some category. 
Heck, despite offering to be her new best friend, Miranda even kind of looks down upon Danielle too, since the most she does is humor her imagination rather than ask her questions. Or she scribbles down notes on her behavior instead of doing something real to actually fix the problem she's picking up on. She never once suggests anything to help Danielle. She just blows off her warnings or yells at her like her parents do, which did kind of lead to Danielle's breakdown because of that distrust. Not to mention that she does a rather terrible job at easing the situation when Danielle is panicking and distressed in the dark climax. She actually tries to force Danielle to let her go to save her own skin over consoling her and keeping a level head on. So it's not like Miranda knew what to do or always paid attention either. Not trying to blame Miranda for bringing her own fate onto herself, but she did kind of make the situation much worse by cracking. I think the moral about how we don't pay enough attention to detail is done very well. The Twilight Zone didn't even have to include a moral in this killer doll story, but they did that anyway, and I think it managed to pull it off super phenomenally. That's honestly why I think this Twilight Zone tale can cover up its plot holes as well. The episode has something to say, and the fact that Danielle is capable of getting away with her grand magical skills unnoticed by everyone, even without her own parents and police looking into all the missing people cases, perfectly demonstrated what the little girl was crying about the entire time. How no one wants to be her friend because she's practically invisible to everyone. No one listens to her. She's just a project and not a person. That actually speaks much more volumes of brilliance than that stupid, stupid, sensuous Cindy crap did. Why does this episode get tossed out with the other bad 2000s Twilight Zone episodes when it had so much greatness going for it? In short, the plot, the moral, and the story structure were pretty solid. The characters were also pretty interesting. The parents are more or less side characters, but they serve as the catalyst, building up to all the horrors that take place in this episode, and possibly Danielle's whole life. Yeah, I'm pissed too that they never get called out or killed for it, but again, the story is vague enough to allow people to think that it's only a matter of time before they get added to the collection, too. At least that's my wishful thinking. Miranda was also a great character, with a few intriguing traits to make her stand out. She wants to become a brilliant child psychologist while using babysitting as a means to enhance her skills of understanding a variety of kids. However, when she babysits the all-powerful witch Danielle, she soon realizes that she's way in over her head and suffers because of her mistakes. I think there was a point about her overconfidence causing her downfall somewhere in there, but she's still cool in the end, since she adds to the adults need to be more emotional than logical moral. The killer dolls were pretty creepy antagonists who do strike terror in your eyes, but the fact that they are revealed to be victims fighting back manages to add a thought-provoking layer of the tragedy to them that you don't really see coming until afterwards. And Danielle. Oh, poor, sweet, sad, lonely, wooby destroyer of worlds, Danielle. She was actually a pretty dang good tragic villain for this show. Out of all the supernatural boogeymen we see on the Twilight Zone, let alone the lackluster 2000s Twilight Zone, mind you, this villain managed to be quite the amazing monster of the week I have ever seen from this series so far. This is a villain that the audience can both dread, hate with a passion, and even feel sympathy for all at the same time. I think Danielle is an incredible character from this series and demonstrates how to write a good tragic villain. I'm curious to know exactly how she got these whimsical powers to change people into toys and why she doesn't lash out against the jerk parents despite their screwed up connections to one another. She's so interesting. So congratulations, Gen 3 Twilight Zone. I hope Danielle eventually makes her way to the Marvel Cinematic Universe when Avengers 20 comes around. And of course, the largest praise I have overall is that the horror is good. The scary moments are pretty dang creepy. 
If you can believe it or not, the episode never really goes into jump scare territory as much as you'd think it would. A lot of the fear comes from the fridge horror, where you have to think about all the suffering these characters are going through before, during, and after the horror story concludes. Those dolls are all actually sentient people trapped forever in a glass prison cabinet, watching the girl who tormented them all her life, and getting abused by her horrible parents for all eternity. The episode shows us that they find it hard to move like normal people do, have to play with this disturbed, broken madwoman, and have their lives completely in her hands. That is pure nightmare fuel in its greatest form right there. Not to mention that Danielle is very likely going to continue this unsettling little game of hers for the rest of her life. And when she learns even more magic, things might get all carry on us. So yep, this episode has so much to love that I could go on for as long as the years them dolls were stuck in prison. It was that cool. Sadly, there is one and only one reason why I can't grant this tale a perfect score. Jessica Simpson's acting. While Danielle's actress does a very good job for the most part, minus some bland reactions, Jessica Simpson was the one who costed this story a flawless victory. Simpson is pretty passable at the start, but when the dolls start attacking and all the grim horror consumes the characters in the climax, she just sounds so bad when she has to pretend she's scared of what's going on all around her. Damn it. Yeah, it's kind of weak. I'm sorry, but in the epic showdown where all the horror is happening, your lead actors need to give the proper emotions. Otherwise, they weaken the story when they have weak reactions to serious occurrences. It's just a fact that your actors need to feel like believable characters, and Simpson just couldn't pull it off all throughout this story when she needed to. However, I will admit that Simpson was only bad for half of the episode, so I'm only taking away half a point. See, I can be a nice kitty when I want to be. That's really all the bad I have to say about this. Simpson just has a few weak acting moments here and there that suck you out of the tension. Other than that, I thought it was fantastic. A gripping plot, disturbing horror, unique characters, original scares, new ideas for the killer doll formula, intense pacing, and a shocking tragic side underneath it all. In the end, the collection is a very worthy trophy, acting as a Twilight Zone collectible. So, I grant this underrated G3 Twilight Zone story a gold skull. Not a perfect score, sadly, but it did come so, so very close. I highly recommend checking the story out if you demand proof that the 2000s Twilight Zone did have any good spooky stories under its belt, because I think this one does give a good name for the reboot. What's not to love? The narrative is well tailored, the horror is very much present, the fridge horror is unnerving, the characters are interesting, the story actually works, it has a powerful moral about paying attention to detail and treating people with emotional care instead of like stats on a chart, and best of all, it truly does feel like something right out of the Twilight Zone. Much like getting a new toy, it feels so good to obtain it for the very first time, but it gets even funner once you take it outside of the box. Remember to like, comment, share, and subscribe, or just tune in for more videos posted here on Wolf Entertainment. I'm your host, Catastrophe, and I hope you're ready for some more trips into this unnatural, quirky, parallel dimension known as... The Twilight Zone.